So I had this whole video edited, ready to go, ready to be released while I was on the Colorado Trail. I realized I've made a pretty big mistake and I really wanted you to know about it before you just go watch this video and think that everything is hunky-dory here. So I wish I'd known this sooner and uh, let's dive in and you're gonna find out what I did wrong. Oh, hello everybody. Today on the channel, I'm gonna be answering a bunch of questions that you guys asked me in relation to my post about going on the Colorado Trail, I said, what do you wanna know? And you chimed in with so many questions. The dominant thing that you wanted to know about was all the food that I was gonna pack with me. So I'm gonna lead off the video with my food prep and then dive into the rest of the Q&A. There were some really good questions out there, so let's get into it. I'm gonna be hiking from Durango to Silverton. This is one of my favorite parts of Colorado. So I'm gonna be going for five days. The first thing that I like to do is I like to lay everything out and group things into breakfasts, dinners, and essentially lunches slash sla slacks. Essentially lunches and snacks and everything that's in between from when I wake up and eat breakfast and when I eat dinner. I feel like it's really helpful to actually see it laid out in a way that you can visualize it and make sure that you're packing enough food. Generally speaking, a good weight to aim for is about two pounds of food per day. So for this trip, I'm doing something a little bit less interesting on my food. I'm not really gonna be cooking a lot of fresh food. That's kind of different for me. I often do like to cook with fresh food on the trail. It just adds a nice element, but I especially like doing that when I'm cooking for another person or sharing that meal with somebody else. I'm going by myself. Something that I'm interested in doing on this trip is actually to go as lightweight as possible possible. Part of the easiest ways to shave some of that weight is just to take the most simple food you can, freeze-dried food, food that's not carrying any water weight. I'm going to be taking a smattering from across the market. I've got some peak refuel, trail topia, pinnacle, which has been one of my longtime favorites, good to go, and farm to summit. So I actually have a different meal a different meal brand for every night on the trail. I have five meals, one, two, three, four, five. I actually am taking a little bit of some backup food. So this is just some cheesy mashed potatoes that are just real easy, you just add some hot water to them. I actually have an extra good to go meal here. And these are kind of my, oops, something went a little bit wrong and I'm gonna need some extra food, some calories. Maybe I go a little bit slower than I anticipate, or maybe I twist an ankle, or maybe you know something happens and I don't wanna run out of food out there. Or I wanna have the ability to extend my trip by at least 24 hours comfortably, where I'm not really concerned about food. I'll be able to send out a text and notify people that, hey, I'm gonna be a day later, but it's really, it's no big deal. So I like to have some extra calories available in case I do stick around for an extra day. So this is some backup food, this is some backup food, but all things considered, it's looking pretty good. Now there is one other thing that I do wanna point out, is I actually really like looking at calorie counts on these meals. So this one from Peak Refuel has 920 calories. That is a lot. So I'm gonna save this for one of my bigger days. I'm gonna try to not eat this right out of the gate, because that's a lot of calories and I'm gonna be wanting that. This one has 860. Again, anything over 700 is pretty good and that's what I look for. Sometimes if the meals are under 700, I feel really, really hungry when I eat that. So this one is right at 700. This is borderline not enough, but that's where some of these other snacks and food might come in here for me. And then this is the one that I'm really concerned about. Whenever it says one serving per pouch or feeds two hungry hikers, mm, it's, it's a two to one ratio, two servings for one me. That is another reason why I'm bringing this is by the time that I get to this meal, there's a good chance I'm gonna be pretty ravenous and 410 calories isn't gonna be enough. So I might make one of these at like 5 p.m. and then eat another one at like 7 p.m. And then I've got one from Farm to Summit. I actually just tried this company for the first time on one of my last backpacking trips and it was pretty tasty. Breakfasts, I like to also pair these up and just lump these together so that I can see and make sure I've got, oh, one, two, three, four, five breakfasts. Okay, I'm good to go. So again, I'm doing a smattering here. I've got 
One of my meals, breakfast, is gonna be the biscuits and sausage gravy. And I'm gonna probably save this for a big day. This has 1,100 calories in it. That's a lot of calories. That's kind of a gut bomb, but I'm excited about eating that gut bomb. Next, I have breakfast hash, again, from Good To Go. And then I've got some granola. And then I'm doing some more grocery store acquired food. So not the freeze dried stuff, not the stuff from REI or your camping store or whatnot. So I just got some Kodiak cakes, some oatmeal. And these are basically like those cheap granola ones, but they're not as sugary and they just have a little bit more protein. One of the mornings I'm gonna eat two of these packets. One just isn't enough. And I'm gonna also have a fig bar or actually a strawberry oatmeal crumble bar. For one of my other meals, I bought some store-bought granola. This is from RX, the brand RX. Some tasty kind of chocolatey granola. Now, I feel like the lunches and snacks is actually one of the hardest things to account for. If you get into hiking mode, you might not eat that much and you might be totally ravenous and plow through a ton of food. I have five packages of tuna, one for every day. I've been finding these pre-flavored packages are actually quite good, but I do have a couple that are just plain, and then that's where this comes in. I got this jalapeno condiment that I'm pretty excited about because that will spice up anything that just ends up being pretty boring, whether that's my tuna or whether that's one of these dehydrated meals or freeze-dried meals. It's kind of really nice to have. It's a little bit of a luxury item, but I'm excited to take this with me. And then I've also got a trail bar per day. So I really like pro bars. They are super good. I also have trail mix, of course, kind of a classic dried fruit. I've got mangoes. It's kind of nice to have something that tastes sweet, but it is important to know that sugary things like dried fruit are really short-term energy boosts. They, they give you that little sugar boost, they're satisfying and sweet, they taste good, but they don't provide that really long-lasting energy on the trail, like something that's high in fat, meat or trail jerky or even peanuts and things like that are gonna do. Next, I have some energy chews. So I've got some Stretch, I've got some from Pro Bar. Kind of casually eat a couple of these. Uh, throughout the trail, maybe two or three in a couple hours just to get a little caffeine boost. I really am a big fan of hiking with some of these meats. These are Lanjegers, uh, just kind of like a Bavarian style meat or like a pepperoni stick. And I have 10 of these, so two per day, a bag of beef jerky. All of these things I like to package into my own Ziploc bags. If I get stuff from the grocery store, like this granola, I prefer carrying it in my own Ziploc bags. A few other things that I highly recommend is having something that just hits home for you. So when you're feeling like a little bit ragged on the trail, kind of losing that mojo, having some things that just really hit the spot. For me, that's honey mustard pretzels and then Justin's peanut butter cups and peanut butter M&Ms. Last but not least, I have my coffee. Now these are, I drink these all the time. These are my favorite, most easy way to do coffee in the backcountry. This is from Alpine Start. You can find them at REI. You can find them at a lot of places. They're my favorite coffee solution for when I really am trying to go light. FYI, I do have to take a bear canister because there are black bears in Colorado. I've got my bear vault and I'm gonna pack all this stuff up and then I'm gonna move on into the next round of my Q&A here. This in the bear canister weighs seven pounds. Uh, the bear canister itself weighs just a hair under two pounds. And then this weighs five pounds. So all things considered, I've got about 11 pounds of food for a five day trip. I actually think that's about right. I do aim for about two pounds per day. And then I just have a little bit extra food, a bum ankle or something that kind of just goes wrong. I have some backup calories, so I can spend an extra night out there, but I would still be just fine. I'd be out there skipping. Let's pack this away and let's dive into the rest of the Q&A. 
So what did I do wrong? Well, I did all this food prep and I went on the trail and then about three days into the trail, I realized, whoa, I have way too much food for this trip. So in one of my boneheaded moves here, I was thinking, okay, I've got five days for this trip. That means I need five nights and five breakfasts. And then I thought, you know what? I want some extra, so let's pack some extra and have six. I don't know what I was thinking. For five days on the trail, I only need four nights worth of food. I massively overpacked. I have just come back from the trail and I have five pounds worth of food that I didn't eat. I was thinking about it wrong. Five days should not equal 10 pounds. Really, I'm thinking about like four nights and five days. And so really, I should have been closer to eight pounds of food, not what I actually carried, which was about 11 and a half pounds of food. So I was eating more than I could handle. And I still have, granted, some of this is trash, but uh, this is a lot of stinking food. And I made one more mistake too. So I had this all ready to go, but I realized when it came down to it, I couldn't quite fit enough food in it for it. So I originally thought, well, I'll just hang it in a dry sack, but then that's not bear safe and bear resistant. So then I put my extra food in the ursac, the same thing that I'd been trying to avoid all along. And then I actually ended up bringing a bear can and a bear sack and that really wasn't a very smart strategy at all. I could have put all of this food into the bear sack if I was gonna do a bear sack at all and just saved the whole two pounds of this bear can and streamlined my process and then not had to carry this thing that wouldn't ever shrink and downsize. I just, my head was jumbled. The rest of this video is still totally valid and I wanted to let you know the thinking behind it, but since I had an opportunity to catch this video before it went live, I wanted to present a few of the things that I learned about this video. And while I'm here, I did wanna let you know that I'm gonna be doing a gear grades video on all of the gear that passed with flying colors and some of the stuff that didn't actually perform that well. If you're interested in that video, that's coming out next week, but for all the people who are watching this down the road, check out the link right here. That's it, let's resume to real time before I go on this trip. Here we go with the rest of the video. Okay, we're gonna dive into a little q and I posed a question about what topics you wanted to hear about and you chimed in with about 100 comments. So thank you all for uh, hitting me up with those. I've seen a lot of themes here pop up, so I wanna address some of this. Here's one that actually came up a surprising amount of times. Jimdog999 says, my biggest anxiety to any trip is how to figure out where you're gonna camp and finding places while on the trail to set up camp. I would love to hear how you do this. I almost never give this much thought. Now, there are certain areas where if you're gonna be in a Grand Canyon or a national park or somewhere with very competitive camp spots or permitted camp spots, then yeah, I definitely research it, I look into it, and I plan ahead to make sure that I'm doing the right thing and make sure that I have a place to stay. For a trail like this, that's not the case. This is just, it's either national forest or it's wilderness. Dispersed camping is encouraged. So that being said, I will probably come across 500 good options a day. Now this is the West, it's Colorado, and there's gonna be tons of options. If you are out East and maybe there's a lot more private land, then yeah, that's probably a harder hoop to jump through to figure it out. But generally speaking, if you're going into National Forest or one of these kind of federally managed areas like this, you just go and figure it out and that's the joy of being out on the trail, not knowing where you're gonna stay that night not having everything dialed into the T. Dad in the hip, Dadane thip, Dadane thip. Somebody posed a question, I'm also planning two weeks on the Colorado Trail next summer, figuring out logistics of where I'll park while on the trail, how to find a shuttle to the trailhead if not parking there, shuttles back, anything you can show for transportation would be great. I'm not doing the full trail, so my question or my answer is a little different, but I am parking at Durango, at the trailhead in Durango, and setting off. I. We'll be hiking all the way to Molas Pass, where the highway that runs between Durango and Silverton runs. And I'm gonna emerge onto the highway, stick out a thumb and hitchhike back to Durango. The Colorado Trail Foundation has a lot of information and blogs and resources for people who are interested in doing it themselves. If you ever need a shuttle or anything like that, 
these kind of locally organized resources can be really helpful for diving in to figuring out how to do that. Food storage and bear precautions, I have talked about that a couple of times, but uh, I'm taking a bear can. Black bears, not brown bears or grizzly bears in the area. Just because they're black bears and not grizzly bears doesn't mean that it's safe and easy, but I will be taking precautions with how I'm handling my food, where I'm cooking and things like that. Lots of food planning stuff, lots of food planning questions. The Vega 58, it'd be great to see how you plan out your trip, what apps you use, what maps you bring, meal planning advice, and why you chose specific routes. Let's uh, do a little time jump here. I have actually made it back from my trip, but I did wanna answer this question because I thought it was actually a pretty big change that happened. So the app that I found to be the most helpful for the Colorado Trail was actually called the Far Out app. And I had never used this before, but the night before I left, I was reading a blog that recommended the Far Out app. And so I downloaded it, paid for the Colorado Trail map and actually found it to be incredibly helpful. It was well worth the 20 bucks that I spent. This isn't an advertisement. I genuinely paid for it with my money and I have no relationship with them. And the real reason why it's so helpful is because of the community integration for the map. So all the through hikers that are going through, they're labeling things that are very, very helpful to label, mostly water sources. This will also tie into a f another question that came up here in the Q&A, is how do you plan water sources? Well, this map is actually very, very helpful for it. So you can actually see all these little water droplets on the map, click on it, and then you will get a detailed bit of information about it, including what comments from other hikers have said. Good water supply, plenty of water. There's a lake outlet near here that you can fill up at. There's campsites, 0.4 southbound of here. Things that are really, really helpful that you can't get without the community interaction here. Far Out seems to be the route, seems to be the app that the vast majority of all the through hikers for the Colorado Trail were using. So that meant that this was a really, really helpful tool to have in my pocket because there were actually some stretches of land that didn't have water. And so I could see what was reliable and what was maybe unreliable. So this was a super helpful map, an app that I've never used before until now and was very, very impressed with it. Okay, back to the Q&A. As a flatlander, how do you prep for altitude or how do you build in shorter days at the start to get acclimated? Hard to practice that in Minnesota. Yeah, totally. Altitude acclimatization is a big part of this. Luckily for me, I live at the same altitude that Durango is. So I'm at 7,000 feet. The start of the trail is at 7,000 feet. And I've done some local hikes up the mountain here that's up to 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet here. So I feel pretty good. But if I were doing this from lower sea level or you know just somewhere else where it's just not nearly as high, yeah. That day one, I'm probably only gonna try to go like eight miles or something like that and work my way, steady my way into it because going 20 miles at 10,000 feet just ain't gonna happen if I'm not acclimatized. Okay, how do you plan water sources? I will carry, generally speaking, one to two liters at any given time with the ability to carry a third liter if I'm going to be staying, camping, and spending the night farther away from a water source. So that way I can have my food for, have my water for cooking or being around camp, even if maybe the nearest water source is like half a mile away or whatever, a mile away, I can still do all of that. All, all things considered, it should be pretty abundant with water. And if it's not, I'll have the ability to carry three liters and that should be plenty for a trail like that. I would love to see how you plan to charge up all your electronics, how much of your filming is planned in advance, and if, um, yeah, if you're gonna script anything, which no, I don't script any of my videos. This is going to be an electronics intensive backpacking trip, which is one of the reasons why I'm trying to go as light as I can with my food and with some of my other gear, because I'm doing this as a solo individual. Well, that's what solo means. And I'm carrying all of my camera equipment, so I'm gonna be carrying uh, my R5, my Canon R5, I'm gonna be carrying 10 batteries so that I can go through two per day. And then I'm also gonna be carrying a drone, the DJI Mini Pro 3. I'm gonna be carrying at least 10 pounds of camera equipment and electronics 
And for the most part, I'm not gonna be taking a battery bank. I will have four drone batteries with me and I can charge my phone off of that if I need to. I'm having difficulties with preparing for my trip to Croatia. My biggest issue is with water. How do you prepare and research whether a filter is enough or also purification is need needed? Or do you just take four liters with you for a two day hike? Would love to know how you prepare your hydration. Now, if you're going international like this person, then having a water purifier is pretty important. I would definitely carry one. The best one I like for that kind of travel is the Grail, the GeoPress or one of those like 16 ounce Grails. They're great to throw in a backpack. They're super easy. They're very fast, very convenient. They filter out viruses, which is the concern with international travel. And yeah, I don't think you need to just haul all of your food. There is a lot of water in Croatia and you should be good to go with something like that. So I'm just gonna be taking my Life Straw. It is a super lightweight, easy water filter. And when it's empty, it packs down to just weighs a couple ounces. So that's the one I'm excited about for that. Another question about water, any pointers on this would be great. My friend and I are planning on going to Big Bend here in the near future and this would be very helpful. Well, knowing Big Bend, you're probably gonna have to haul a lot of water. So I like the Water Cell X, that's from Sea to Summit, and that is a great water hauling device. And you're probably gonna need to have at least four liters of water on you because that, getting water sources out there can be difficult. Here in Colorado, not so bad. What about the whole through hike rather than just a section? Well, you know, the full thing takes about 30 days and I have a week. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be getting married here soon and I gotta keep my trips a little bit shorter. I can't go off and do a full through trail. I would love to, sounds amazing, but not for this stage in life. Did you have to apply for a permit? Uh, no, I didn't have to apply for a permit here. This trail system, it's basically just national forest. And so you can just go. If you're going into a national park or some of these other areas that are heavily managed or with really high traffic areas, you do need permits. And recreation.gov is a good resource for if you need a permit. And as well as just looking on blogs because sometimes those permits are managed by somebody else. Apparently a lot of people do want to actually see my bunions, so that's good news. I'll try to have some foot shots in this video. How to be prepared for rain uh, and wet weather because monsoons are probably gonna be up there. Yeah, so there's probably up in the mountains up there it has been, recently, it has just turned into a wet monsoon season. It was very, very dry, but I'm probably gonna have to battle some monsoons. So I've got rain gear. Uh, I've got my gear, my clothes, and my sitting bags in backup dry bags that are gonna keep my stuff interior, inside my backpack dry, even if it rains. I don't really hike with pack covers anymore because even with heavy downpours, I found that my gear still has a tendency to get wet. So instead of doing that, I'm doing dry bags and other like things like my Packstack Pro or my Event from Sea to Summit inside my backpack. I'm gonna have a, an umbrella, which is actually gonna be mostly for sun, but also in case it does rain and I can still have my camera out and film. Oh, and just rain jackets. I'll have rain jacket and rain pants. I like the full zip rain pants and uh, that way I can keep my boots on or my shoes on when I take them on and off. So if you can afford the extra pricey zip up rain pants, I recommend those. Getting to the trailhead, planning the trip, where you're going to stay, looking for water sources, getting your passes arranged. I've been backpacking for long enough that I'm not concerned about having most of these things super well organized. I would kind of go fly by the seat of my pants. That's one of the things that I love about backpacking is that every day is an adventure and I don't know I don't always know where I'm gonna end up at the end of the day. That being said, there are some logistics with permits and things like that, and thankfully this is an area that doesn't require them, so I should be good to go. And as for passes, blogs are very helpful to research if you might need them. Typically, I will Google, do I need a permit to camp here? And usually there's a lot of very quick, obvious information that says yes or no, and recreation.gov is another resource for those who are looking into permits and passes. And you can always call a ranger station. I always recommend calling ranger stations. Rangers are very, very helpful and they really wanna make sure that they are not conducting rescues. So they will do a lot to make sure that you are safe, to give you the information that you need because they are much prefer talking to somebody for 30 minutes versus mounting a midnight rescue with 20 people, canvassing the mountainside and hauling a body out. So that being said, rangers are very good resources. Call them up, they are your friend, 
and they can be very helpful. This is probably a, gonna be a long video with my food prep and the Q&A here tied together. Thank you all for the amazing questions and for your interest in this trip. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up, leave it here, and I hope that you enjoy this video, have found it helpful, and that you stick around for the actual trip video. I'm very excited for this, and think it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, I can tell my voice is getting a little ragged, so I gotta shut this one down. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Eric Hansen, see you on the trail.